Thank you so much for doing this, Professor Wolf. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So I wanted to ask you really quickly, one thing we've been seeing, or at least I've been seeing all over, all over different kinds of media, is that uh, people just don't want to get back to work. People are lazy. They don't want to get back to work. And uh, it's causing problems with businesses. What's, a, what's the, the reality of this situation? Uh, well, you know, it's an insult to working people. It should be called out for doing that. Um, it's an insult particularly outrageous at the end of a 14-month period, the likes of which the United States has never before seen in its entire history. Yes, we've had viral pandemics in the past, bad ones. And yes, we have had terrible crashes of our economic system, recessions and depressions. But we have never had both of those catastrophes at the same time, never before. That's what the last 15 or 16 months have been all about. An economic crash of our capitalist system overlaid by a failure to cope with a pandemic. And this has meant extraordinary suffering, measured, for example, by the simple fact that the United States has 4% of the world's population, but suffered 20% of the world's COVID deaths. By the fact that over the last 16 months, we have seen over 82 million Americans, that's more than half the labor force of this country, have to file for unemployment insurance some for a few weeks, some for the entire 16 months. It's absolutely unprecedented. When you're unemployed on the scale like that, you use up whatever savings you might have had. You become a burden on your family, your friends. Children suffer even though they're purely innocent uh, as the children of people who have to go through an unemployment like this. So of course, the government helped by giving them a little bit of a boost up on top of their normal unemployment. But it was very modest for what is the worst catastrophe in American history. And now to say that because they're hesitant to go back to work in environments that are not yet clearly safe, under conditions that are far from securely safe, to work for employers who have been noteworthy in not spending the money they could have spent to make the places safer, to, to insult them by calling them lazy, that takes a level of nearly fascistic hostility to the working class that I find nothing short of outrageous uh, and reprehensible. Having said that, let me answer another way. In economics, we teach something. If you have a demand for labor that is greater than the supply of labor, one of the things you expect to happen, and indeed you predict will happen, is that wages will rise because that's how employers draw more labor out of a population by offering more wages. That is the reasonable thing to do. That is the frequently expected things to do. What we have in the United States is an employer class that doesn't want to do that. And there's no mystery why. They also, as employers, suffered over the last 16 months. They had to relearn the lesson that you don't make profits in a business because you have good machines or because you have the right raw materials or because you have a great idea. You get profits if and only if workers come nine to five, five days of the week and pour their brains and muscles into the job. And they weren't able to do that for parts or all of the last 16 months. So they want to make big profits to make up for what didn't work out. And the bottom line then is they want all those workers to come to work without having the proper safety, without 
having the higher wages to bring them. They want to force them to work in insecure, unsafe, inadequately safe, and insufficiently paid. The workers, too, you know, have to make up for the last 16 months, not just the employers. So the bottom line for me is you've got a classic class struggle going on here. Employers who want to boost their profits by getting those workers in there, not spending money on making it maximally safe and not spending money on raising wages. And that's all that's going on. And the working class, to its credit, is resisting. Uh, 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 is what they're saying. You got to pay us more or make better, safer conditions or both. But you're not forcing us back. And the ugliest dimension of this is the 50% of the states in the United States, 25 out of 50 states, have now cut back on the extra $300 a week that was given to the workers on unemployment during this worst catastrophe in U.S. history. They're taking it away, not because workers don't need it, not because it isn't crucial. It's more crucial now than ever, but they're doing it to force workers back to work by saying, we're going to make your life so difficult by taking away these $300 that you'll be willing to go and work in an unsafe place for really crappy wages. This in any other country would be called forced labor. And that's what the United States is doing. You don't have to go to the Uyghurs in China. We got it right here. I wanted to ask you, uh, just switching gears a little bit. It's it's related, though. Um, there was a big story published a couple days ago, a lot of people have been talking about, that uh, some reporters went through some IRS files, and uh, a report was published that... Uh, kind of uh, sheds a little bit of light, maybe nothing we don't already know, about how the uh, the 0.1% of uh, wealthy people in the country uh, don't pay as much taxes as maybe you would guess that they do. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, it's a very well-known uh, website, ProPublica. Uh, they pride themselves on what we used to call investigative journalism. Uh, they were able to get documents from the Internal Revenue Service, uh, and this is the story they say, um, that were leaked uh, to them, provided to them. They spent several months going through them to make sure that they were accurate, uh, that they cross-checked them, and they checked them with other information. And the bottom line, as you quite rightly say, unsurprising, the richest people in the United States Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, uh, you name them, uh, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, the, I believe it was the 25 richest billionaires in the United States altogether pay way, way, way lower rates of taxation to Uncle Sam than the rest of us do. Uh, in other words, we've got an economic system and a political system that gives to those who already have by taking away from those who don't already have, making the vast majority of taxpayers pay much more than they should or otherwise would to enable those with the greatest ability to pay to end up paying little or nothing. Many of these billionaires paid a tax rate below 1%. Uh, compared to what uh, all the rest of us pay. And all it goes to show you is that if you're the richest in this capitalist system, you can pay for the politicians you need to write the laws that you need to make all this tax evasion legal. It is a reflection of the fundamental injustice that this capitalist system breeds. Do you think that there's any hope uh, within this current system to avoid things like this? Within this system, no. I think we have seen in the history of the United States, and it's similarly true in other countries, 
all kinds of efforts by all sorts of well-intentioned people who tell themselves and the rest of us, we are going to reform this system. We're going to fix its flaws. We're going to correct its injustices. We're going to redo the taxes. We're going to redo government spending. We're going to redo the educational system. We hear it all the time. And I don't mean to suggest that these people are necessarily lying to us or dishonest or not making the effort. I think many of them are, in fact, honest, trying, making a good effort. But this system has shown us either that you can't get the reform or in those cases when we have gotten the reforms, we can't maintain them. In other words, this is a system which having given you a reform, which they didn't want, tells you, okay, you can celebrate for a week, a month, or a year, but we are going to undo the reform and you just watch us. I'll give you two examples. In the depths of the depression of the 1930s, for the first time, the United States passed a minimum wage. No employer, the government said. And both Republicans and Democrats eventually passed this legislation, and the President Franklin Roosevelt at the time signed it into law. And so we had for the first time a minimum wage. If you go to work and you do your 40 hours a week, an employer cannot pay you below a certain minimum. Well, here's the irony. Today, we still have a minimum wage, but we have allowed prices to rise without raising the minimum wage. So what you can afford to buy has been shrinking. For example, the last time the minimum wage in America was raised was in the year 2009, where it was raised to the lofty level of the federal minimum wage today, $7.25 an hour. Try to live on that. Since 2009, in every year since then, prices rose, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. But in all those years, count them, 12 years, in all those years, the minimum wage was never raised. It was 725 in 2009, it's 725 as I speak. That is an outrageous undermining of that reform. My second example, is another thing from the Great Depression, because we got more reforms then than at any other time in American history. The reform we got then was the President Roosevelt going on the radio, there was no TV then, and saying if the private sector in America is unwilling or unable to hire the tens of millions of unemployed at that time, then I as President have no choice but to do so myself. From 1934 to 1941, 15 million Americans unemployed were given work, jobs, good ones, well-paying jobs. We solved that unemployment problem, or at least a good part of it, in that excellent way. Well, over the last 16 months, we've had equally horrible unemployment. Guess what we didn't have? A federal jobs program. It's as if the whole idea of that reform and the fact that it worked real well back in the 1930s has been obliterated. That the employer class, to, which doesn't want this, wants to see people unemployed, not hired by the government. They don't want to pay the taxes that would be needed to pay those workers for the jobs that they do. So we don't have it anymore. The reforms, when in fact achieved, are then systematically undone. And because of that, I draw the logical conclusion. We can't keep trying to reform 
a system that resists reform and has done so over and over again. If I can end with a metaphor, if you have a very old, broken down refrigerator and you keep calling the refrigerator repair people who come to your home and fix the condenser or replace the motor, at a certain point, that repair man or that repair woman will turn to you and say, look, I can come to your house, I can fix it again, but you'll be on the phone to me a month or two from now. It's very expensive. I got to tell you, it's not worth it. You've got to bite the bullet and get a new refrigerator. We've got to understand capitalism is over like the old refrigerator. We got to get a new and different system because fixing the old one is throwing good money after bad. I think uh, that perfectly leads into the next thing I was going to ask you. I uh, asked a lot of my viewers and YouTube subscribers what they would want to ask you. And over and over again, people brought up the Jordan Peterson debate that you were supposed okay. to have that he ended up not doing. But he did he did debate Slavoj Žižek, which was good. But I wanted to ask you, uh, and I think this ties into what you were just saying, one of his uh, one of his problems with uh, with evolving out of this system is that uh, there's a natural tendency toward hierarchy, which this system sort of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, supports or embraces or something like that. How would you answer that sort of, uh, that sort of explanation? Well, yes, yes. Let me uh, remind everyone that uh, there was supposed to be a debate. It had been organized, by the way, around Jordan Peterson and his work. Uh, by the faculty and students at uh, Boise State University in, uh, in Boise. And I went out there. Uh, he didn't, even though he had agreed to it earlier. Um, and he, may, he makes the kind of comment you just quoted. So let me respond. First of all, every system of unequal political power has seen whoever holds that power, the king, the emperor, the chief, the czar, the kaiser, the, you fill in the blank, every one of them has tried to justify and perpetuate their position on top by suggesting it's natural. That is, like Peterson, that there's something in our nature as animals or as human beings, a particular species of animal that makes all this necessary. Look, the same people at the top used to try another similar argument, that they were in touch with God. That's right, they were God's agent on earth, some religions still have a leader who is in touch with, maybe is infallible because he or she is in touch with deities, one or more. This idea means you couldn't possibly question or disagree or oppose this leader in this dominant position, because that would be the equivalent of opposing or dis disagreeing with God himself, herself, or however you conceive of all of that. So I'm not surprised that people with a disproportionate amount of power want to give the rest of us the feeling that it should be that way, that it must be that way, that we cannot live without it. You know, the kings used to say there could be no civilization if they weren't in charge of all the rest of us who were their subjects, as they like to say. Well, let me give everybody a reminder. A time came in the history of most countries on this planet when we got rid of kings. Some of us in some countries did that quite peacefully. In other countries, say France, uh, they separated king's heads from the rest of their bodies, as you know. And guess what? The promised disintegration of civilization never showed up. We're civilized still. We have our strengths and weaknesses, 
as we did before, but the absence of a king turned out not to be a problem, anything like what those kings had tried to get us to believe. I always find it bizarre that the same people who want to make a big deal about how human beings are different from all the rest of the animals, then when they find it convenient to shore up their political power, suddenly want to say that we're like the animals. And I'm putting aside here whether they've understood those animals correctly uh, or not. For me, it's simple. Even if you believe that there is some hierarchy, some arrangement among people living in communities that assigns one function to, to some and other functions. If you, for example, as in the debates around feminism and sexism, if you want to say, well, one part of the society has the children and the other part doesn't, and that this is a natural difference, biological and so on, that doesn't require the subordination of the one that has the children, which is the point of all feminism to underscore. And I would take that argument one step further. Even if there is a hierarchy of positions in a society, doesn't mean that the same people occupy one or the other. Communities have always understood that if you need a division of labor, if you need some hierarchy of authority, the safest way to have that and equality and democracy is to make sure that all the people are rotated through the different positions. So that if you have some authority over others for this purpose and this period of time, you never forget that in another period of time, a year from now, six months from now, you will be in the other position and the ones who are subordinate now will be in the authoritative position. By having rotation, you can get whatever benefits authority and hierarchy may convey if any, but you will not have the ordering of people because you rotate everybody through it. Bottom line, don't be fooled by people who want to justify authority and lean on nature or religion uh, to do so. There's something I really wanted to ask you uh, specific to your new book, uh, The Sickness is the System. There's a section where you're talking about how, you know, viruses and pandemics and, you know, this kind of illness spreading across the world has always been part of human history. Uh, but there's this there's this thing going on right now where people are using this to villainize a certain part of the world, namely China. What, what What's your take on this? What's going on here? Yeah, it, it's extraordinary. And it's very sad. Uh, and there's a kind of desperation that leads to this behavior. And, and let me explain it historically, which is always the best way kind of to go at this. The last time the United States had a pandemic, a viral pandemic, was in 1918 at the conclusion of World War I. It was a terrible virus and it spread through the United States, ultimately killing 700,000 Americans. By the way, that's still 100,000 more than have so far died from COVID here in the United States. So at least as I'm speaking to you, that was even worse than the one we're suffering now. Where did that virus start? Answer, in an army base in the state of Kansas in the middle of the United States. But no one ever called it the American virus because it happened to start here. Nobody in their right mind thought to give a virus a nationality because that's really weird. That's not how biology works. 
national boundaries are something human beings do. Nature doesn't do that. Why was it called the Spanish flu? Because that was the name it got. Not because it had anything to do with Spain. It didn't start in Spain. It didn't end in Spain. It didn't impact Spain more than other countries. Here was the answer that might amuse you. The censorship operated in many countries, including the United States. Politicians didn't tell people about the virus using the excuse there would be a panic. As of course always happens, the panic did happen. The word did get out, but because people weren't properly informed, it was only worse than it would have had to be. The Spanish were the only country that did not subject the virus to censorship. So everybody heard about the virus's damage in Spain because the government allowed the media there to talk about it, to interview victims, people who had gotten sick, people who had lost loved ones, and so on. The idea that today you would nationalize the virus because it seems to have started in the Chinese city of Wuhan to somehow suggest that this virus is Chinese is really grotesque. There's no biology to support it. There's really nothing but one thing that can be pointed to. The government of the United States that has been doing this, which is mostly the Republican government of Donald Trump, failed miserably to prepare for this virus, failed miserably to test for it failed miserably to cope. Let me repeat the statistic that summarizes all of this. We are 4% of the world's population, and we have suffered 20% of the world's COVID deaths. We are one of the richest countries on earth with one of the most developed medical systems on earth, and that is a colossal failure. What all politicians I've ever known do when confronted with their obvious responsibility for a colossal failure is to try to blame somebody else. Enter China. China is the scapegoat. China is the bad guy for whom we're going to find blame for the virus. It's nonsense. It's preposterous. But it is typical, particularly for the Trump government. Let's remember that before the virus hit, as the mass of people have to face the decline of the capitalist economic system we live in, which has been going on before Mr. Trump, but got accelerated by Mr. Trump, as Americans were struggling with the loss of income, the loss of jobs, particularly the loss of good income and jobs for their kids. They were open to, they were susceptible, vulnerable to being provided with a scapegoat. Just as China is the scapegoat for the failure of the United States to manage this virus, Mr. Trump tried to sell to the American people that the desperately poor refugees and immigrants from Central America trying to get into the United States to escape the military violence, to escape the poverty, to escape the climate change ravaging their part of the world, that they were somehow the responsible party, that they represented an invasion that threatened the United States. We are 325 million people. The best estimates I know of for undocumented immigrants in the United States at this time is in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million. You cannot explain the economic problems of 325 million Americans by anything having to do with 10 to 12 million undocumented immigrants, most of whom do the worst work at the lowest pay of all of our citizens. 
it is disgusting. So this uh, blame game that you're talking about here is part of a, a larger story between these two political parties that involves, and you've talked a little bit about this, that involves a sort of a breaking apart or scrambling to figure out what to do next uh, with these two parties that are kind of uh, falling apart a little bit. Where do, where do you see this headed? Where, if you had to bet on this, what, what's, what's the uh, end story uh, with these two political parties in the United States? Well, I think the parties are a reflection, are a consequence, are a symptom of what is going on in the larger political economy of the United States. And again, the history is the clue. From around the time we became an independent country, by means of our, our violent revolution against the British uh, that controlled this colony here uh, in this country, when we revolted, roughly the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th, we then experienced, up until the 1970s, something like 150 to 175 years of remarkable economic growth. It really was remarkable. It had its dark side. For example, the ethnic cleansing of the Native Americans. Horrible, cruel, and part of American psychology we haven't begun to get rid of. But with virgin land taken from the Native Americans, with a crop the rest of the world wanted, cotton, with slaves to do the work of the cotton in the South, and so on, we became a wealthy country. And our wealth and our power and our prestige grew for 150 years. And for that period of time, the following was true. Every generation did live better than the one before. Every generation's parents could promise to their children a better life than the parents themselves had been able to enjoy. American exceptionalism was born. The mistake of American exceptionalism was precisely not to ask what was exceptional here? Would it last? And the answer is, what was exceptional wouldn't last. That what was exceptional was your place in the world, your ability to basically take an entire continent with good rivers and good climate and all the rest of it away from the people who had lived here for millennia and bend it to your own European purposes. And that that would not last forever. In the 1970s, the truth of it is, it was over. The 150 years of rising wages, rising productivity, rising profitability of capitalist enterprises came to an end. What began to happen was the enterprises replaced workers who they did not now want to pay wages to with machines, what we call automation. Many Amer American companies left the United States to produce instead where wages were lower, something capitalists have always done. But before, they had left New England to go to the Midwest, or they'd left the Midwest to go to the South or the Southwest or to California. But now they were making a move out of the United States to Mexico, to Canada, to India, to China, to Brazil, the whole world. So the jobs began to disappear and the wages stopped rising along with the jobs. Americans could have and should have had a debate in the 1970s. What do we do in a country where we've all come to expect rising wages, but it's over? A country in which we thought we were an exceptional place that would last like this forever, but clearly we were mistaken. We never had these conversations. No political leadership dared say it. So the American people solved, and I put that in, in quotation marks, their problem. The, if the wages didn't go up, 
How do you have the American dream that you can't afford with your wages that aren't going up anymore? Answer, you borrow money. American workers became pioneers, but of a new kind, not in a covered wagon going over the prairie, but instead borrowing more money than any working class on the history and the history of this world ever borrowed. Borrow for your home, a mortgage. Borrow for your car. Borrow for your daily uh, credit card expenses. And the big one of the last 25 years, borrow to send your kid to college. We are loaded up with debt. And the crash in 2008 was when that delaying tactic delaying facing the end of the American growth story now has to be faced when we could not pay our debts because the underlying income wasn't enough to do so. We're in a, a decline period now. It was great fun for the American people on the way up with capitalism for 150 years. It's a very different story when you're past your peak and you're on the way down. And that's difficult for Americans. It's difficult for the Republican Party. It's difficult for the Democratic Party. It produced the tensions, the conflicts, the bitterness that threw away the old leadership of the Republican Party and replaced it with Mr. Trump. It is the same set of forces that are undermining the Democratic centrist which still control the party, and moving consciousness over to the left, the progressives, uh, the Bernie Sanders, the AOCs, the Cory Bushes, and the more and more of those folks that are coming down the pike. It is, and this there's no nice way to say this, it is the decline of an empire. The United States had, ironically, both the most powerful empire the world has seen and also the shortest lived one. And what we're now seeing is the passage of capitalism out of the United States as its dynamic center and moving, it has already done that, to a dynamic center somewhere else. And that somewhere else is called the People's Republic of China. And crucial to the passage of the dynamic center of capitalism was the decisions by the capitalists themselves. General Motors sells more cars in China than it does in the United States. You have to understand, it was the capitalists who moved their production who made their billions of investments in China, that is a key part of this story. I don't want to take away from the contribution that the Chinese themselves have made. It could not have happened without them. But it is likely also true that it could not have happened had not the most dynamic, growth-oriented capitalists of the United States, of Britain, of France, of Germany, of Italy, of Japan, also moved into China to take advantage of their low wages, to take advantage of their highly developed infrastructure, to take advantage of the enormous growth of science, technology, universities, and everything else that the Chinese Communist Party has led China for since they took over in 1949. That's the reality. And we're either, we in the United States, we're either going to come to terms with this new dynamic center or we're going to be left behind. Let me conclude by reminding all of us of our history. The British tried to stop the United States from becoming a competitor. We had to fight a revolution for years to become free of the British in 1774, five, six. 
It wasn't that much later in the War of 1812 that the British tried again to squelch and control the emerging competitor. It didn't work. And over the next century, up until the present, roles have been reversed. The dominant Britain has become a small comma at the end of the dominant U.S., we should learn from that and try to have a better story to tell about the movement of the dynamic center of capitalism from the U.S. to China than the sad story of Britain, which you can see now has been reduced to a small, cold, wet island off the mainland of Europe. I wanted to ask you, I mean, moving into, uh, you've kind of laid out the problem, and I want to talk about different strategies that people are, whether psychologically or actually as activists, trying to come up with to deal with these problems. And one of them, this might be a little bit of a a weird question here, but one one phenomenon that we've noticed over the past couple years is, mostly among young guys, is this sort of worship of guys like Elon Musk. And I think to me, when I look at this, I see like that's a way for them to deal with these problems that maybe somebody like Elon Musk is going to save, you know, the 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 the, you know, going to going to save us from climate disaster and stuff like this and going to bring us into a new uh, technological world. What, what do you make of this? Well, I think in a way you've answered uh, your own question. This is fantasy. This is the attempt in a declining capitalism to find something to hold on to that can save you. I understand that, I sympathize. I'm not happy that I live in a society that is declining. I think it's dishonest to pretend it isn't the case, but I take no pleasure at all. And I want to find ways out, and I think I have found some, and I am pursuing them. But I hope and believe that they're realistic Imagining that Elon Musk, or for that matter, Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or any of the other folks whose names and pictures are in the media all the time because they're billionaires, that they are somehow going to do this is really fantasy. They don't even claim that for themselves. And these are people with immense egos. They claim that they're good at making money, which clearly they have some skill at. But beyond that, no. Uh, Let's take Elon Musk. Anyone who pays attention knows that the system of the individual automobile that we have developed over the last century in the capitalistically organized world means that we despoil the planet for oil and gas, for the metal, for the plastic that goes in to an individual automobile that spews pollution. Just so you know, uh, the automobile is the largest cause of air pollution, which in turn is a major cause of cancer uh, and on and on. Automobiles kill 40, 50,000 people in the United States every year. They're much more dangerous to us as a people than our wars have been or than COVID could be over the long haul that the cars have been here. So we know what is a better way to handle the transportation systems we need. Remembering that most private automobiles are sitting in someone's driveway, in someone's garage, on the street parked most of the time. It is a wildly expensive, dangerous waste of resources. What we need is what's called mass transportation. Buses, trains, airplanes, things that can move groups of people much more cheaply, with much less waste of resources, much less uh, pollution than the private automobile. 
The solution to the world's problem is therefore the transition from the private automobile to a public mass transportation system. Elon Musk is taking us from one kind of private car system based on fossil fuel, oil, oil and gasoline, and moving us instead to electronic private automobiles. This is makes him a lot of money, may make some improvement in the pollution, but falls light years short of what we could have if what we did was do the rational thing scientifically informed to save our climate rather than do what is privately profitable for Elon Musk and now all the people copy, copying him, which is going to stick us with an electronic version of the private automobile system that we've inherited from capitalism because we didn't have the care and the daring to go beyond private profit capitalism to solve our problems. I'm glad uh, I'm glad you ended there because uh, that's that was my next question is you know your one of your prescriptions here for these problems is more democratic workplaces uh, worker cooperatives right. and I got this question a bunch from uh, you know subscribers and people who watch my channel they want to know how do you if you see uh, the 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 majority you, you you know you you want to see the majority of workplaces to be democratic how do you make that switch in the real world how does that does it just come from changing hearts and minds or is there a revolution required to this how do you see this happening well i think it won't happen unless it happens in lots of different ways my reading of history again shows me that uh the end of feudalism for example in europe uh, the system that existed there for a thousand years, roughly 500 AD to roughly 1500 AD. The way out of feudalism that replaced the lord and serf system that we call feudalism with the employer-employee, very different system that we call capitalism, that happened in a lot of different ways uh, at a lot of different moments in history before it coalesced into a general change. And I expect that to happen with the transition from the employer-employee system of capitalism to the worker co-op, the democratization of enterprises, so that factories, offices, and stores are collectively run. One person, one vote, we together, all of us, in each enterprise, deciding majority rule, what we're going to produce, what technology we're going to use, where we're going to do all of this, and what we're going to do with the profits our enterprise generates by all of our work. This system already exists in the world because people are doing it. I like to tell the story, some of you I'm sure know, of the famous Mondragon Cooperative Corporation in Spain. It is now the seventh largest corporation in the country of Spain. It started in 1956 when a Roman Catholic priest decided that the only way jobs in his parish, in a little town in the north of Spain, the only way the, 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 the people in his parish would get jobs is if they set it up themselves. He made a joke. If we wait for some employer to come in here and give us jobs, we'll all die of old age before that happens. So why don't we just set up our own business and run it ourselves? Give ourselves jobs, which they did. Six workers and a priest in 1956. Today, Mondragon employs over 100,000 workers, most of them organized as worker co-ops. So co-ops can develop, we know that. Co-ops can grow spectacularly. Look at this example I just gave you. By the way, two American corporations have a long history of partnering with the Mondragon Corporation because they have laboratories being such a big company and these American companies wanted to have their scientists working alongside the scientists working for Mondragon to pick up tips. The name of the two American corporations that do that, General Motors and Microsoft, they have confidence 
in the capabilities of worker co-ops, even if the average American citizen doesn't know enough to do the same. There's a province in Italy called Emilia Romagna. It's the area around Bologna, if you know a little bit about Italian geography. The economy there is 40% worker co-ops. We have dozens, hundreds of worker co-ops here in the United States. There's even an association called the United States Federation of Worker Co-ops. So they're developing. We don't have to have any worry all around the world here in the United States too. And let me give you a, a sample of some of the ways. Here's one. A church, often in a neighborhood that needs to get some economic development going, decides to raise money as startup capital for a worker co-op. They don't want to have an employer come in. Maybe they've waited for one a long time, like those folks in Spain. So the church comes up with some money as startup capital for a group, say, of its parishioners to set up a business. Has that happened? Yes. Could that happen more? You bet. Here's another one that may surprise you. All over the United States, there are what we call small or medium businesses. I'm going to make one up as an example for you. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, 50 years ago, a business in Wisconsin somewhere. And they worked very hard in a little town. And slowly they grew. Person by person, they hired to join their business. And over those 50 years, they grew until they had, oh, let's say 200 employees. People they knew by name, who lived in the same town, whose kids went to the same schools. Uh, and now they're 65 years of age, this Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and they've had it with this work. They want to retire. And now the question is, since it's their business, what are they going to do with the business they don't want any longer to be responsible for? Let's go through their options. They could just shut it down, close it, but they don't want to do that because that would take away the jobs of the 200 people that they know and that have come to depend on these jobs for their income, for their home, for their life. They're not going to do that. Second, they could sell their company to another company, but that raises the same problems because once that sale is done, who knows what the new owners will do, and that jeopardizes everything they've built and everything that this... Uh, enterprise means to the 200 people that work there, everything this enterprise means to the community that relies on the taxes paid by the enterprise, plus those paid by the 200 workers. All right, here's another option. They could go public. They could issue shares and become a corporation. But then again, they don't know who buys those shares and what those new owners will do. Here comes the something that may surprise you. There's another option. They could sell their enterprise to the 200 workers. In other words, they could convert the privately owned enterprise owned by Mr. and Mrs. Smith into a worker co-op owned collectively and democratically by the 200 workers who have made their livings there. The, the, the value or the virtue, if you like, of this is that the jobs are maintained, that the presence of this enterprise in this community is maintained. And here's what may surprise you even more. In many American states, if you do that, you get better tax advantages from selling your business than if you sold it to another company or you went public. In other words, Years ago, progressive politicians created a little bit, particularly in the Midwest, of an incentive for this sort of thing because they thought it was a good idea. So it turns out, and I've been personally involved in this, it turns out that small and medium capitalistically organized businesses are some of the best candidates to convert themselves into worker co-ops, where the initiative is taken not by the workers, 
but by the owners who have a feeling of community, a sense of solidarity with their employees, and so forth. This kind of thing is happening all over the world, and it is happening as we speak here in the United States. A last example. Here in the United States, we have a number of government programs to help certain kinds of business that we have thought as a nation deserved extra help. The most famous is called the Small Business Administration, the SBA. It's been around in Washington, D.C. for many decades. The Small Business Administration helps small businesses. It provides low interest loans to help them through. It provides specialized advice. It helps them get orders from government, which is a big buyer in this country. In the long run, what it was designed to do was to create a level playing field, to use the old phrase, between big business and little business. The little businesses of America felt outmaneuvered and outcompeted by big businesses who were crushing them. So they got the government to say it's important to American society to have small businesses, not just big ones. And so we're going to give them some special help. Something similar was done with minority owned businesses to give that part of the community some help with businesses owned and operated by women because of the traditional discrimination against them in the world of business. Well, guess what, folks? I have another candidate, co-ops. We ought to give the American people cooperative businesses in every community so that we can all, as American citizens, finally have some freedom of choice that we will know because it's in our community what it's like to work in a worker co-op, what it's like to shop from a worker co-op. Let young people who are deciding what kind of work life they're going to pursue be able to choose between working in a traditional capitalist hierarchical enterprise on the one hand or a democratic worker cooperative enterprise on the other. Our American citizens can't choose because they don't know. And one of the ways to give them the knowledge that would make an informed choice possible would be for the government to create a cooperative business administration right alongside the small business administration to help make it possible. These and other ways are all part of a broad social transition, which is already underway but which I think is about to become much accelerated because of the acceleration of the decline of capitalism in the West, in, the, in North America, Western Europe, and Japan, even as the dynamic center moves to India and China and Brazil and so on. Well, another question I had to ask related to that is, you know, when we're thinking about improving society, like you were talking about better transportation and better medical care and even housing, you you live in New York, right? So, I mean, you know about how, how I live in a big city. Housing is, you know, it's a, it can be a disaster in a lot of parts of the country. As right. part of this bigger push toward a sort of a, a better society overall, how does this organization of of businesses factor into that, changing that larger political uh, structure? Well, I, I think the way to understand this is the following. Capitalism is a system, as I've said before, that organizes its people insofar as productive enterprises, factories, offices, church, uh, factories, offices, and stores uh, are concerned into a very peculiar arrangement. A small minority, the employers, make all the key business decisions. They decide what the enterprise produces, what technology it uses, where it carries out production, and what is done with the profits that everybody's labor has helped to produce. 
And of course, if you have a minority with that amount of power positioned to have that much decision-making power, you really can't be dis- surprised if it takes the bulk of whatever profits are generated for itself. It uses it to, to live in mansions, uh, to accumulate the kind of wealth that we talk about with uh, uh, Elon Musk or Bill Gates or any of the others. It likes to hold on to its power. All of this is understandable. And the way it is established in our society is by saying that there's something natural or necessary in a business, any business, any factory, office, or store, that it should be governed by, here comes the phrase, profit is our bottom line. In other words, we're in business to make money. I take them at their word. I'm a professor of economics. That's what the textbooks teach them. That's what they believe. And it makes sense that the business should be focused on profit because the profit flows into the hands of the employer minority. What doesn't make sense is for the majority of the employees to accept the proposition that the goal of a business is to be profitable. Because what they're then saying, but they don't seem to understand it, is that the goal of this business where we're all working is to make a lot of money for a tiny minority of us, not all of us. We don't get the profit. That's what the employer gets. If the workers themselves ran the businesses, they wouldn't prioritize profits because they'd have many other additional important goals. How happy am I working here? How good is the air here at the factory? Is it enhancing my knowledge, my mental health, my physical health to be working here? All of those things are very important, not just the profit. All of the workers, if they were part owner operators, would understand, sure, as an owner operator, I am interested in the profit that we can generate. But since I'm also a worker, I'm likewise interested in the quality of the air I breathe, in the amount of pollution this enterprise pours into the family where my wife, my husband, my children, my parents live. All of these other things are going to be just as important as is the profit because they will all get a piece of the profit and it won't be a tiny group of people who get all of the profit. This is not rocket science. If you had a cooperative economic system, it would generate democratically what this enterprise is is going to shoot for, what its targets are going to be. What are the things it wants? And it'll adjust those. What it will not do is come up with some fakery that says there's something mystical in the nature of of work itself that makes profit the thing you want to maximize, your bottom line, your main goal, your key objective. None of that. That's an indirect way of saying Enterprises are run for the employers. And you, the rest of you, you can breathe bad air. You can get sick. You can barely get by with what we pay you. But it doesn't matter because if it's profitable, that's what the system rewards. Look, that's a good description of capitalism. But it's an equally good description of why, if you want to deal with inequality, if you want to deal with the climate crisis we're living through, you need to change the district, the decision making on the ground, at the base of society. Let me give you a simple example. If there's a new technology that will improve profits, but has the unfortunate side effect of dumping some bad chemical into the air. The current capitalist system, the board of directors is very likely to adopt the new technology because it's more profitable and profit is what they're in business for. 
Besides, they live 30 miles away in a gated community in a lovely mansion that has machines to clean the air that they breathe. But now imagine if that same enterprise was run as a co-op democratically by all its workers. Would they be interested in the machine because it raises profits? Yes. But they would also be very sensitive to being told that one of the effects of that new machine is to cause asthma to increase among their kids and a variety of other lung ailments to be impacted by the bad pollution of the air. And will they always decide to forget the profits and go with better technology? No. Sometimes they'll weigh the profit advantage to the climate disadvantage and vote in favor of the new technology. They may, but they're going to be making that decision, taking into account the climatic effects in a way that capitalist business never has and is not doing now. I have to ask, uh, you know, when you're trying to push for more of these businesses that are structured this way how do you deal with a you know mega a mega ultra monopoly like uh amazon yeah such a great question in the history of capitalism this same problem was encountered over and over again what people don't understand often about capitalism is they don't ask the logical question when capitalists get together and celebrate competition, how wonderful capitalism is because it has competition, they don't ask the logical question, what is the end result of competition? Well, let me explain. I'll use an example. I'll pick again the automobile industry just because I know it, not because it's any different from anything else. But if you go back 100 years, we had 50 automobile companies competing in the United States, 50. And you know, each of them tried to make a car that people would want to buy at a price that people would want to pay. They weren't all equally successful in doing that. So over time, people went for the cars that had the better quality and the lower price. And when the customers did that, they abandoned the companies who had the poorer quality cars and the higher prices. And those companies, by losing their customers, collapsed. What happened when they collapsed? Well, first of all, they fired all their workers. Where did those workers go? Well, they were experienced automobile workers. So they went to the companies that were successful in the automobile industry and said, well, my company collapsed, but I'm skilled at this work or that work. Would you hire me? Well, here's an interesting fact just to think about. When a company collapses and stops producing cars, the customers it once had that it was losing, now it loses all of them because it's not there anymore. Where do all the people go who want to buy a car after the one company goes belly up? They go to the companies that remain. In other words, as one company dies, more people are shifting to the company that wins the competition. Well, to make a long story short, the end result of competition is that the winners of competition eat the losers. They buy the raw materials that those who go out of business no longer want. They hire the workers that those who go out of business no longer can employ. And so a few companies become, excuse me, many competing companies become few. That's the result of competition. Or to say the same thing simply, we now have uh, General Motors, Ford, and uh, Chrysler, barely. We have very few car companies left. For a while, in the latter part of the 20th century, that's all we had, three car companies, because all the others had been eaten up, absorbed. 
Competition destroys itself. Marx loved to point out that contradiction. So every, capitalism, like other systems, becomes monopolistic. And when that happens, when there are only a few, they can really rip the rest of us off because we have nowhere else to go. There are no other cars in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. There were hardly any other cars. People bought American cars here in the United States. And the only way anybody else could break in, particularly the Germans with the VW and the Japanese with their cars, was by coming in with something of a really better quality at a really lower price. Uh, but for a long time, those three automobile companies, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, ruled the roost. Well, worker co-ops have the same problem. They may be successful. They may compete against one another. And those who win the competition will become larger and those who lose it smaller. But because it's a collective, they may not react to that situation by saying, hey, let's keep on competing. Let's keep on getting larger. Why not? Well, because the profits are not concentrated in a small number of people. And the experience of working in the workplace is equally important. And they don't want hugeness. They don't want to not know who all the other workers in their enterprise are. They want the solidarity, the knowing one another, the long experience of working together, the closeness to the larger community of which their enterprise is a part. For them, growth is not the be all and the end all in the way that profit making enterprises basically have got to focus on. They can enter much more easily, these worker co-ops, into agreements with one another that we don't want to come up with ways for some of us to destroy others. We're not interested in that. We're interested in keeping pretty much the way we're going. So let's focus our uh, efforts to develop technology somewhere else that doesn't disturb the industry where we are. Let's focus on other problems our community has, develop new technologies and new enterprises to install those technologies and build our society that way. I want to underscore that if you change your economic system, say from slavery to feudalism or from feudalism to capitalism, or from capitalism to worker co-ops, you're changing a fundamental characteristic of your society. And that will in turn influence your culture, your politics, your religion, your family life in altogether different ways. Americans like to go to Europe in the summer to look at the remarkable residue of feudalism the uh, chateaus on the rivers in France, the castles on the rivers in, in Germany, and so on. The remarkable, but we don't have that anymore. We don't build that. We have a different architecture, a different structure. We have what capitalism produces, which is radically different from what feudalism or what slavery produced. And we're going to have a whole new set of ways of living, of dressing, of, of moving that come out of a worker co-op economic system. And we have to, A, be pioneers. We're going in a new direction. We're building a new society. We have the, the romance of that. We have the pioneering experience of that. But we also have the gold of the fact that the system we grew up in, capitalism, in this country is dying. It's declining. So part of the reason we're going somewhere else is because it beckons, it offers us a new world, a better world. But part of the reason we're going is if we stay with capitalism, we are going to go down with it. 
I got. Uh, I just got two more questions for you, Professor yep. Wolf. One of one of them good, and one of them a little annoying from the okay. from from my YouTube community. But uh, right. one one kind of uh, I don't know. I don't know if you see this, but kind of a common response to any kind of uh, challenging of the current uh, economic system. You usually end up in some conversation about innovation. What right. uh, what what's your take on? Uh, changing this economic system and and uh, and innovation yeah i've always found this to be um a kind of conceit enormous innovations were made in societies uh in which the dominant economic system was slavery enormous innovations were made in societies where the dominant economic structure was feudalism and the same is true of capitalism. I think there is something very human about looking around at the world you live in and saying, can we do better than this? And that's not being disrespectful to what you have. It's not being disrespectful to what your parents or the previous generation gave you. It is part of a human desire uh, to leave something behind when we die that shows we had we contributed something. We made something easier or better or more pleasurable or whatever it is uh, that we do. So some of us build a better mousetrap. Some of us sing. Some of us develop new kinds of music. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I think it's conceded for any of these systems to start playing games about which one is more or less. It's like saying, which is more, an apple or an orange? It's a mistake. These are different things. Yes, each system develops its innovations differently. Some systems innovate over there. Others innovate over there. Uh, but each of them has done innovation. I mean, let me take the example of something I think almost everyone listening or watching will see as valuable, democracy. If you take a course in the concept of democracy, you will probably early on in the semester be told that there was this leader in Athens, in ancient Greece, 5,000 years ago, Pericles by name, and that something was developed there which was called Athenian democracy, and in many ways provided the concept and the ideas of democracy ever since. I think that's true. I think they developed a notion of democracy which has been absolutely profound in its impact on the world for the last 5,000 years. But you have to understand that the economy of Athens at the time of Pericles was a slave economic system that the majority of persons, human beings, living and working in Athens at that time were the property of a minority. In other words, you had slavery. And yet they came up with something spectacular in terms of its impact uh, on the world. And my guess is that if we make the transition, I think we're underway making from capitalism to a democratized enterprise system, you're going to see all kinds of technological changes that we haven't seen before. That didn't make sense to capitalists, but will make sense uh, to worker co-ops. Just like we saw developments that didn't make sense to feudals made by capitalists, or didn't make sense to slave masters made by feudal lords, and so on. I got this. So here's the question that I got. I don't know why, but I got this question a lot from uh, people when I asked, what should I ask Professor Wolf? A lot okay. of people asked. And to, to me, I don't see right now a whole lot of value to society in cryptocurrency. There's a lot of uh, utopian talk about cryptocurrency from a certain group of people online. I don't, I don't see it too much. Do you see anything in cryptocurrency right now besides a sort of a, what I see it as a little bit of a, a scammy situation? 
I see in cryptocurrency something I have seen before. So you will please pardon me if I once again dip into history to help me make sense of something new that's happening. So here's what I see. The monetary systems of the world, uh, the control of the currency by a central bank in each country, like the Bank of England or the Bank of France, or the bank here in the United States, which has the funny name Federal Reserve System, but is basically our central bank, uh, just doesn't call itself that. When you look at how these governmental institutions work out a relationship with the private banks of these countries, including our own, you are watching a classic capitalist maneuver. The government is captured by the industry it's supposed to regulate. Every industry that gets regulated, for example, the taxi cabs, who when they began in this country a century or more ago, uh, were, were running over people and assaulting passengers and not maintaining the taxis in decent shape, and all the rest of it not vetting the drivers. Everything we hear about Uber and Lyft today was true about the cabs in the past. And the end result was, as happened so often in capitalism, that the government was called in to regulate this industry because leaving the industry, taxi cabs in this case, to private profit was too dangerous, caused too many taxi cab uh, company owners to cut corners, to make profits at the expense of their public, of their passengers, and of their drivers. Okay, the government comes in and regulates. Some of what the government does, these companies don't like. They want to be free to do whatever it is they were doing in the past. They know that the job of the government is to help the public. They're not the public, they're the profit makers. So there's bitterness and there's tension. The solution to that tension, nine times out of 10, is for the regulated industry to turn around and capture the regulator, to go to the regulators and say, hey, uh, we don't want to be your enemy. And if you treat us nicely, then when your term as commissioner of taxis is over in two years, we will make you an executive of our taxi company and you'll earn five times what you earn as commissioner of the taxi business. Or you want to run for political office, we'll donate to your campaign. Or we'll put money in a bank account in Switzerland nobody will know about but will be yours. Or, and I could go on, in this way, the regulator stays there the public still hears about the regulating commission, but what that commission does is what the industry they're supposed to regulate allows them to do. That's what we have. That's what we have had over and over again. So I don't have confidence, if you like, in this process. I don't think this system uh, allows a genuine public interest to prevail. And I don't, I don't find that surprising. If you have an economic system, once again, that positions a small minority atop your economic structure, namely the employer class, and they make profits to the extent that they can get work out of the vast majority, the employees, while paying them the least they can get away with, you're creating enmity, hostility, or if you like, class struggle built right into your system. And that stru structure will reproduce itself, will use the control it can get over the government to reproduce itself, to keep itself in power and wealthy. That's why we see the ProPublica tax results that we talked about earlier. And then for me, um, this is a sign that system change 
is the only way we can get beyond the failures uh, that regulation has always exhibited. What would you say to, uh, you know, a lot, I think a lot of uh, young, younger people are open to this message to uh, economic change like this. What uh, advice would you give to younger people watching this on how to actually make this change happen? Be true to yourself. Your, your younger generation is the only thing that can save this society. The old people have been trapped within, have accommodated, have adjusted to capitalism all their lives. It's not a critique. It's what you do to get by. It's what you do to make headway in a system. You can't by yourself change the rules. That has to be a social change. And social changes are made by social movements. The idea that social change can be done by a tiny number of people or some key individuals that's that same capitalist conceit. It's the conceit of that minority that runs business that thinks the whole world works that way. It doesn't. It never did. The leaders always thought they were making it happen because they couldn't face the terrible reality that they couldn't make anything happen unless and until huge numbers of people agreed with them or at least agreed to follow them. They don't want to face their dependence on the larger community. But I would argue, be true to yourself. If you are a young person in America, and if you've been paying attention, you know your job opportunities, your income opportunities are lousy. The debts you've likely accumulated to go to school are enormous. And that school and that degree that you got is less valuable for the rest of your life than ever, even though it costs more than ever, and that there's something terribly wrong here. You can't decide to have a child. You can't decide to get married. You can't decide all kinds of things because you're jammed up in a financial circumstance that makes all of your calculations difficult, uncertain, and not the things you most want and most love in your life. When that happens, the system is failing you. If we don't have people earning enough money on the one hand, or rents low enough to afford a decent apartment, that's not the failure of the person who isn't getting the wage, and it's not the failure of the person who's overcharging for the apartment. It's a system failure. It's the job of an economic system to serve the people in it, not the other way around. Don't let anybody tell you the market decides. The market is a human institution. We, the people, established it. And if it doesn't serve our purposes, it is absolutely our right to question that institution, to challenge that institution, and to say, either you give me a wage that I can afford an apartment, or you give me a rental that I can afford with the wage you're paying me. But if you don't pay me enough, at the same time you allow the prices to be high, so I end up being homeless or living under conditions that are not humane, then that's a system failure just as it is to say you can't have a college degree without being loaded up with fifty thousand dollars of debt that you have to carry for the rest of your life that is an outrageous burden to put on a person who got an education so that he and she or she can be more productive contribute more to the society they're going to live the rest of their life in don't let the blame for a failed economic system turn you away from being part of the solution, which is to build the social movements that can fix this. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for talking to me today. Get his books, go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Professor Richard Wolf, thank you so much for doing this.
My pleasure, and thank you for creating a program that is honest and open enough to talk about these things. Hey everybody, and thanks so much for watching this video. Like all the other YouTube and podcast perverts, I now have a Patreon. Every week on this Patreon, I'm uploading two exclusive Patreon exclusive shows. They're like real shows, more produced, more edited. A behind the scenes show where I reveal all my secrets and a show where we go deep on an important topic that you will want to know about. Also, you get the daily and complete live show audio only feeds. And at the top level, for only 25 bones, you can become a producer. These people that you're seeing right here make this program possible. Without them, nothing. It goes right in the toilet, right, right, right in, the, in, the, in, the, in the trash, and we set it on fire. It's these people who make it work. So please, for Christ's sake, become a patron. Bye-bye. Love you.